Welcome to the latest Acro podcast brought to you by Acropolis. I'm pleased to introduce the host of today's program, Dr. Michael Bernstein from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Dr. Sergey Castaneda from Miami Cancer Institute, Baptist Healthcare, South Florida. Great. Thank you so much, Frazier, for the kind introduction and welcome everyone to our Acro podcast. Uh, we are in for a real treat today. It's an, a pleasure to have Sergey join me as a, a co-host here. Yes, thank you, Michael and Fraser. It's a pleasure to help co-host today's program for sure. Thank you, Sergey. So it is a real honor for us to be joined by our guest speaker today, Dr. Paul Ramaser, my good friend and colleague from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Ramaser is a board certified radiation oncologist with expertise in the treatment and management of GI cancers. He is, an, he is also an active clinical trialist and a member of the NRG GI Cancer Committees and the NCI Rectal Anal Cancer Task Force. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. So Paul, just to jump right in, as we all know, you were involved, intimately involved in a recent groundbreaking study involving the treatment of rectal cancer without using the traditional modalities of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Can you tell us a little bit more about the trial? Thank you, Mike and Sergey, for having me today. And uh, thank you, Frazier, for hosting us. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a recent trial led uh, here at Memorial Sloan Kettering looking at dorsalumab as kind of neoadjuvant or induction therapy for patients who have mismatch repair deficient or MSI, microsatellite stable rectal cancer. And the goal was to look to see, can we use dorsalumab induction to essentially try to get rid of uh, or eliminate the chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. When we started out, though, I don't know if we really thought we'd accomplish that, right? There was kind of a, a wish on the wall. Um, but then we put the first patient on, and, and the first patient went through, and you reassess the patient's you know, especially at the beginning, you're doing clinical reassessments quite often, but you do an endoscopic reassessment at six weeks and again at three months. And we, what we saw was that there was a very striking response that happened early and quickly. And that first patient got us really excited. So can you, Paul, tell us what has been your experience with the trial? Can you give us a few more examples of those patients that, with those striking responses? Absolutely. So, you know, the first one that came in and, and we were still kind of flabbergasted because initially we wrote it that we would use the dorsalumab potentially to avoid chemotherapy. And then we saw the complete response, both not only endoscopically, but also radiographically. And we said, well, do they need radiation? Right. And, and so we said, well, let's, let's reconsider. Let's amend the trial. Let's see if we can make it so we can omit radiation as well and you're omitting surgery on top of it. So you're omitting the three main modalities or backbones that we use in rectal cancer. It was pretty, pretty uh, far out there. And I really credit my colleagues, Andrea Sursek in the Department of Medicine, as well as Luis Diaz in the Department of Medicine. And just to remind everyone, Luis Diaz ran the first trial, right? Showing PD-1 blockade in, in essentially all comers with MSI high patients years before this. And interestingly, if you ever heard Louis talk, uh, he had a hard time getting the drug company to give him the drug to run that trial. And now we're looking back and we're saying, oh yeah, this makes sense. You know, why wouldn't you give the, these patients PD-1 blockade and see if you could avoid, you know, cytotoxic chemo, surgery and radiation, right? But it, it didn't make sense when this kind of all started out. And so, Sergey, to get to your question, we had that first patient come through, we saw the response, Second patient come through, we saw the response. Everyone's thinking it's a fluke. Third, fourth, fifth. And you know, they didn't come that often because it's it's a rare subtype, but they started coming through and we just started seeing it and they they weren't coming back to see me, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and it was wasn't really until we maybe hit the 10th patient that we looked at each other and said, wow. Andre, Luis, and everyone, you guys got some. This is phenomenal. That's great, Paul. That, what exciting results. So you had mentioned and alluded to, but maybe we can go into a little bit further. So 
The standard treatment for rectal cancer is usually a combination or trimodality therapy, some combination of neoadjuvant chemo radiation followed by surgery, maybe even adjuvant radiation there afterward. So when you were explaining this to patients where we're going to try this immunotherapy and this is going to go at very outside the box from the traditional modes of treatment, were they hesitant? Were they excited? Were they looking forward to potentially avoiding the side effects of some of these traditional modalities? What was your experience when you presented the trial to the patients? You know, fortunately, we had Luis's data in the metastatic setting, right? Albeit with a different drug, but we had that data to kind of point to and say, hey, listen, we see a really strong signal. We see 70% response rate. That's better than what we can get you with chemotherapy, radiation therapy um, for a complete response up front right now, right? And so um, that's what we kind of pointed to and looked at. There was certainly hesitancy, right? Especially among the first patients. They were worried about what if I don't respond? Um, what's next? You know, all those possible scenarios. And, and I just found if you walk them through it and you reassure them, let them know that they're not going on an island to get, you know, dorsalumab by themselves and their medical oncologist, that we're all there with them together. I'm there for them if they need it. And, you know, no matter what, the team here at Memorial was there to support them through it, watch them, and make sure that we we're checking in on them periodically enough to know that they were responding. And if they weren't, we were going to immediate, immediately take them off trial and initiate standard of care therapy right? Because that's, this is a curable population. And so you got to watch them really closely. And that's what we promised we would do to them, right? And that's, that's what we did. Um, it's just that no one came back. <laughs> I think that that's absolutely remarkable. And since that publication, and basically in ASCO, uh, a few months ago, when all of us kind of get to know the data, and then we kind of review the paper, and we were astonished and almost in disbelief, like, is this for real? I mean, 12 out of 12 patients, 100% complete clinical response rate. This was unheard of in rectal cancer, basically. And I, I'm curious, since the publication, what has happened? That's a good question, Sergey. You know, what happened was that the New England Journal of Medicine offered to essentially release the paper when Andrea was up giving her plenary session at ASCO. And so essentially the news of this just came out like a bag of bricks hitting everyone. The phone lines for our referral center essentially crashed for two and a half hours after the, the uh, result was public because everyone with rectal cancer from all over the country was calling in to see, you know, were they eligible, could they get in? So we've slowly have, you know, help kind of educate as both in terms of, you know, doing things like this, right? General awareness for medical practitioners, but also general awareness and interviews and stuff like that, uh, just for the general public um, to help people understand, you know, if they have the marker, they can come here for the treatment. And so what we've seen is an incredible increase in patients coming, seeking this treatment from all over the country. And you ask them, how did you know about the trial? They say, oh, I, you know, one person say, I saw it on CNN. Another says, my doctor told me about it and told me I got to come here right away. Um, you know, another one's aunt told them about it. It's, it's everyone has a different story, but now we're seeing that patients are coming from all over because they, they have faith, they believe in it, and they're highly, highly interested in this approach. Thanks, Paul. I think we all share in your excitement when we heard the news and saw it in the New York Times. And so nice to hear that the word is out and potentially offering this new treatment to patients. Where do we stand, do you think, now with uh, patients that are eligible for this approach as far as accepting this as the new standard of care? Or is it already? That's, that's, I think, is a really, really important question, right? Um, we're excited and we see an amazing signal, but is it enough to call it or is it enough to establish a new standard of care? 
I don't think we've hit that bar yet. I, I would certainly encourage this treatment right now to only be done in the context of a clinical trial. And I think we need to show that this is a durable response and that these patients do well over time. And we need to show that these data can be replicated outside of a specialized tertiary cancer center. You know, the expectation that we're going to see a 100% response rate to induction dorsalumab in rectal cancer, I don't think that's really a reasonable expectation, but certainly it's going to be a super high response rate. That's what we're, that's what we're seeing. And so we just need to see, you know, get more data about the generalize, generalizability of this, as well as um, the durability of response. And so I know that uh, Andrea and Luis are working, you know, with colleagues all over the country now to try to kind of forge a way forward and really kind of get this out there as a standard because it has the potential to help so many patients. Absolutely. So, but more broadly speaking, where do you see rectal cancer treatment in the next 10 years? You are in a particular uh, adventist position to talk with people in the labs, get new data, transitional uh, points that allow you to ask questions in clinical trials. So how is that informing what is going to happen in the next 10 years? I think right now we're in the middle of kind of a revolution in terms of how rectal cancer is being treated. And it's it's really exciting. Um, so I think we're clearly seeing a signal, right, uh, uh, that needs validation, but that uh, mismatch repair deficient or microsatellite unstable rectal cancer may, and hopefully by 10 years will be established that should be treated in a different manner than we think about. Um, you know, microsatellite stable rectal cancer. And I think that paradigm shift, I have faith, will definitely be done in the next 10 years. We're also awaiting right now a couple of clinical trials to read out that I think will impact how we think about personalizing treatment for rectal cancer based on the location of tumor. The PROSPECT trial led by Deb Schrag is actually looking at omitting radiation in patients who have high rectal tumors and favorable clinical and tumor characteristics. If that trial is positive, and we're starting to think it may be a successful trial because they're waiting, waiting, waiting to read out the endpoint, which means they're waiting for events to happen. If no events, that's a good thing in this case because they omitted radiation, right? And so if, if that proves to be safe, that means now we can consider or will be considering in the future, omitting radiation for patients who have high tumors. And that's gonna be a big game changer. That's not gonna help these patients have better long-term anal, rectal, and bladder function. It's also gonna decrease the number of patients getting radiation, which is of particular relevance because we're seeing this epidemic of patients who are now under the age of 50 or young adults getting rectal cancer. So they say like in 2010, one in 10 patients was under the age of 50. By 2030, it's gonna be one in four. It's already one in four in my clinic. It's not uncommon for me to see 26 year olds, 30 year olds, I saw a 19 year old about four weeks ago. And these are patients you don't want to give radiation to if you don't have to. So if we can safely omit it, I think that's great. For lower rectal cancers, there's an upcoming trial coming out through the NCI and the uh, NCTN looking now at can we, you know, what's better, uh, double it or triple it chemotherapy in the setting of total neoadjuvant therapy, and now offering patients the option of organ preservation or essentially avoiding surgery. And this is the first time that's going to be looked at in a national trial in the United States. So that's super exciting. That's led by uh, Dr. Josh Smith, and he's really one of the leaders in non-operative management. And I think, um, you know, that's going to really kind of help set the stage if non-operative management can be generalizable to patients around the United States. If we have even those three things, that's a big paradigm change in how we're approaching rectal cancer. And that's not to mention all the early stage trials looking at different radiosensitizers or new immunotherapy or immunotherapy sensitizer combinations that are be coming out further pushing patients along to get complete response rates to either avoid surgery uh, or to avoid surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, what have you. And so we're going to start seeing that 
what was once a one size fits all is now being really subdivided up into really personalized treatments that are being generated for each individual patient. That That's to me, super exciting. That's great, Paul. Thanks so much. And I, I do want to congratulate you for all of your hard work in this field and uh, this arena, because I think we share in your concerns, seeing all of these young patients and seeing the recommendations of starting colonoscopies now at 45, as opposed to traditionally 50. So I want to congratulate you for all your work and in, in helping all these patients. Just to have one final question for you. Do, do you see dostarlamab expanding its use into other areas, uh, other GI cancers, other cancers in general? Is there any ubiquitous cancers that we can maybe be able to treat with this newly found uh, success? That's that's a great question. So um, we see that essentially that in the setting of metastatic disease, that essentially it's almost, not quite, but it's almost tumor agnostic that you're seeing these response rates. It's not quite. There are outliers of who responds and doesn't respond to PD-1 blockade, even in the setting of microcytal instability. Um, and a clear example of that is something like pancreas cancer. But so there is a rationale now that we've seen these excellent results to expand it. In fact, uh, Andrea is literally amending her protocol right now to open it up to other patients and other disease sites that have uh, you know documented proof of microcytal instability um, or mismatch repair deficiency. So I think that question's open and, and we're hoping to get more data on that. So um, maybe when that comes out, I'll be back here talking to you guys about that one again, too. That would be great. We look forward to it. Well, this has really been a wonderful, fruitful conversation. Sergey, I want to thank you for co-hosting and Fraser for organizing. And a special thank you to our guest speaker, Paul, for sharing your experience and expertise on the trial. It was really enlightening. We hope the audience has enjoyed the program as well. We encourage you to continue to follow the Acropolis channel for more engaging and diverse content designed for the radiation oncology community. Thank you. Thank you.